but we could provide a lot of relief to people by saying, and I think Jeff had mentioned this, it needs to be a black mailbox on a white post. That's what the annexation It could be a steel post, states. it could be a metal post. That was the village's requirement. I, I can tell you for sure that people have knocked themselves out trying to find plastic hollow posts just like the ones that were installed originally and have done that two or three times. Yeah, I don't, I don't think in the beginning uh, we didn't, the village didn't pick the mailbox and the post. We just said we wanted them all the same. The, the, the developer did? The, yeah, just, you I know, suppose from the, did, from the homeowner's like point of view. You say the developer a, picked the cheapest ones, plastic, yeah. and that's what you ended up with. I don't think $75 is, is not outrageous to give somebody. And, and if we only have a few, then Steve knows how to do them with concrete. We'll, we'll just let him go out and do them. <laughs> and I'll, I'll, I'll say this. I actually drove through Foxmore or Fairfield, both of them, the other day because I knew that we were going to talk about this. And I'm not exactly sure where the model homes were, but I'm guessing they were near, near across from the gazebo. Yes, that's exactly where they were. I would take a ride past there. Those are wooden posts with white. <laughs> So I'm pretty sure that when the builder built the models, they put wooden posts with black mailboxes in front of them. And then when they developed and put in all the other ones. Now, again, I'm like Steve. At my house, it didn't come with a mailbox and a post. Yeah. You installed your own. Yeah. And I don't think, if I'm correct, the, the village required the plastic construction. They just said white post. And when I drove around, there's an awful lot of those mailboxes and if I'm not mistaken, you don't have an HOA anymore. Correct. Our HOA enforces our yeah. mailbox rule. Yeah. So I'm not sure the village and code enforcement are going to enforce that rule, but there's an awful lot of them out there that aren't black and white well, when my drive around. The mailbox and fence design standards were part of the same page of the annexation agreement. And what really surfaced over the years was a lot of debate about why do we have to use the specific design and style of fence. And the answer was always because it's part of the annexation agreement. And yes, you could be fined if you don't comply with it. You could be required to take the fence down if you don't comply with it. The mailbox standards are on the exact same page. So the residents would reasonably assume the same risk of not following the What's on the paper? We have the confusion. The residents thought what was currently yeah. installed is what they need to replace it with. Exactly right. Yeah, and, and the end, like I said, the annexation agreement didn't doesn't yeah. say that. Just so that would be a huge relief if if we could officially communicate to. I think those are the only two subdivisions that have those plastic right. products. I know that would be well received if we could say it doesn't have to be plastic anymore, but it should look. Paint like it white. To, yeah. and did, did the annexation agreement expire? Not for another six or seven years. It does have a sunset, but it's 20 years probably. 25 or something like that. Todd, isn't there something about uh, because these guys started putting brick <clears throat> in a mailbox in there? I mean, you could hit it with a tank, but yeah. I think what happened is somebody has brother-in-law put one up like that and got ruined, and he said it was worth $2,000 because his brother-in-law handed him a bill, that kind of thing, and I don't know what we what the policy on that now, that goes back to Mike. Uh, I can't say for certain what our policy is on that. Typically, if a homeowner is going to install uh, that elaborate of a mailbox or even a brick paver uh, driveway apron, they're subject to you know putting those things in the right of way and not having them replaced in kind if work needs to be done. Uh, for instance, a water main break in that driveway apron, as I explained, we, we don't restore brick driveway aprons. So you're kind of at your own risk. But I can't speak specifically to our policy. I have had occurrences where a resident has had a pretty elaborate uh, like wrought iron or cast iron mailbox and you know reportedly it cost $1,200. It it sheared off you know how much are we going to pay. Right. Uh, I, I'm in agreement with your comment that we should pay for the replacement value, but uh, I think even that probably needs to have some sort of a, yeah. a top limit. Mm -hmm. I think the $75 is, I, I asked a couple of people at work that had similar, that one guy came home and his mailbox was gone, 
<laughs> and the plow had just plowed the street, so it, they hit it. And um, I think he was in Hanover Park, and it was $75. It was, you know, and they told him that they had to go through insurance and all this sort of stuff, and he called the public works director, and the guy goes, go buy a new one and send me the receipt. <laughs> and there's no forms. There's no insurance. <laughs> just go buy the new one, send me the receipt. Mm -hmm. We'll get you squared away. But theirs was at $75 as well, because it seems like it's a fair amount. You know, it seems reasonable. In Lakewood Creek, you have to have cedar mailbox, cedar post. That's what we're required to have. So I can tell you, if the plow, you know, plow knocked down my post and my mailbox, 75 bucks wouldn't cover it with it being all cedar. But, you know, they I are taking away my snow. I would guess, and I think this is a reasonable guess, if you, if you go to the big box store and buy the pre-constructed timber, uh, with the base plate and just a standard mailbox is probably about a buck fifty. So, seventy-five is probably meeting somebody halfway. Again, I I think that's probably a reasonable estimate. Um, if if you want to make that the upper limit, I'm perfectly fine with that. As I'm understanding it, your application would be the same as ours, where we hit it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, if if, if we're the, hitting, I guess they do have another option. I mean, they don't. They're not required to have a mailbox. Yes, they are. In order to receive mail. Yeah, and are. my dad's neighbor had, doesn't have one. He has a P.O. box. Yeah. I mean, There's somebody in Lakewood yeah, Creek still like receiving that. mail at a location. If you want to campaign on that idea, have at it. <laughs> yeah, no. Yeah, there's, yeah, no, there's but a, yeah, I think $75 is, I mean, bumping that up to that. But the, the process where if snow hits, you know, I think then it's substandard construction, not so much us doing something wrong. <laughs> Are we seeing this primarily in Foxmore and Fairfield where it's the plastic, where it's, is that Those, where it's happening most? That's where we seem to find every mailbox being the same and, and of that construction. But there are a lot of these, uh, as I call them, extruded plastic. They're, they're made by Rubbermaid. They look kind of mm -hmm. unique. Uh, they just don't hold up. They get very brittle and they break very quickly in the cold. Mm. So those are throughout the community. I mean, it's also important to note that as communities have aged, certain subdivisions don't have curbside delivery. They still have front stoop delivery. That's something the post office changed at, at one point. Now the post office is working towards junction boxes um, or gang boxes because they reportedly spend $350 a year uh, per stop, which is the cost to run the postal service, apparently. So there, there may be a time where they ultimately require even these um, historic areas to install. I don't know how they would do that, but I suppose it's entirely possible. Okay. Since the homeowners had no say, in Foxmore Fairfield. Somehow I'm trying to envision a, we'll fix it, we'll help you fix it one more time, but fix it with wood or metal or something. The next time it breaks, it truly is your problem. But I personally am hearing from people that have replaced their mail post three or four times. It's not the mail box, the post snaps in half. And none of those pictures showed that. Right across some of the later ones did. I, I sped up in the interest of time, but there were some that show there's no post inside. It's yep. just hollow. Yep, and they snap right off. That's actually, I think, the more common of what we're experiencing, mm -hmm. and the force of the snow caused that. We caused that damage. The village caused that damage. So to say that we're not in any how responsible for it, I. I don't think is good public policy. We could say we're not going to be responsible for it again once this is replaced. And mainly because of the design of the mailbox is what you're saying. Which was imposed on those two subdivisions. Sure. Right. But are we then opening us up to, if we do it for those two subdivisions, what if somebody else had some requirement that they thought they had to follow in any other part of town? And we said, well, just for Foxmore and Fairfield, because it was just snow knocking it over, we, we thought we could, but we can't do that for you now. Would we have to do it then village-wide? 
done a lot of homework on this issue, and I believe that Foxmoor and Fairfield stand unique in the village as having that written into their annexation agreement. There's nothing in OPN. I mean, our, our mailboxes go, there's some brick mailboxes, there's... I say brick mailboxes in, uh, Rich, you can check with uh, Mike, but I'm sure that was written down somewhere on paper that we don't, we don't do anything to anybody in brick mailboxes because there's a few that started it and then, then they refused to put them up. I mean, they said, the building department said, don't put the things up because we're never going to, uh, and we're afraid the plow is going to knock them down. And check with Mike on that, but I'm sure there's a policy again with Mike Pulitz, but check with Klupar. I'm sorry when I said a short, <laughs> you did a good job at making it short, but let's talk about, can we talk about this next meeting and, or you just want to make it 75 bucks now and, and, or if Stan's got more, maybe next, all I want to do is make sure Todd, before he left, got this in front of us. I'm just, yeah. I'm not sure about the, you know, again, the builder put in shoddy work, but that's not the village's responsibility. That, that particular builder. I had to pay for my own mailbox to be put in. They didn't have to pay anything. They have theirs put in, the builder put it in. But if our truck hits it. Well, yeah, it's but a difference, that's, but that's, yeah, that's, that's not the issue. If right. our truck hits it, I think everybody's on board. It's if our truck hits it, okay. pay for a new mailbox. You know, that's just the way it is, pay the 75 bucks. Mm -hmm. But the snow knocking these old brittle ones down 15 years into it, I'm not sure that that's a rabbit hole I want to jump into. It, the age of it can't be a factor, though, because the annexation agreement hasn't expired. But the annexation agreement doesn't read, put a cheap, crappy plastic post out there. All those, it says put a white post with a black mailbox. Those residents are waiting from communication from the village saying that. They've not heard that. Oh, we can clarify that. Yes. That's easy. Yes, that would be a good start. And then we should finish this conversation with regards to snow hitting the mailbox and what we yeah, want to do. I did a survey of 19 villages, Jeff has it. And of the 19 that I surveyed, only one did not cover damage caused by snow. Like I said, we looked at the four <coughs> that we usually compare it to and they all follow our policy. Part of the thing we need to look at is the type of community, because some of those were like older communities, like where I grew up, they can do that because the, the mailboxes are on the house. So the snow is not knocking them mm -hmm. down a lot of the older communities. Or there's very few that very few. the maximum exposure is very limited right. in some of those older communities that have mostly doorstep delivery. We not only looked at the four, <clears throat> Oswego, Yorkville, Sugar Grove, and North Aurora, I spoke to their staff to see how it was being applied and it's exactly as we are currently applying ours. It's also important to note that you know, on Stan's comment that there are some residents waiting on feedback, there's about 150 addresses to my knowledge. So if you apply the $50 per, you're at $7,500. Uh, if, if we move that up to $75 per, you're at $11,250. It's, it's more than a, a couple of pennies in one direction or another. Uh, yeah, and that is a lot of mailboxes. I mean, well, don't you think? And, and of that 150 that were reported as downed in that last storm, we did look at every single one of them. And uh, if I'm not mistaken, it was only five or six that actually were touched by the truck. So that does happen. It's unfortunate. And a lot of times in that case, it's still the mailbox that's at fault, not the homeowner, but the mailbox has started to lean and it's leaning out over the curb and the truck gets it, um, but of 150, it's a very small percentage that we physically touched with a truck. Yeah, okay. I, I, I agree with what Stan is saying that I, I think if we increase it to $75, that solves part of the problem. But then if, it, I don't think it's the resident's fault that they, the builder put in a crappy mailbox. Oh, and you can bet that was 
in the cost of the house. It didn't. Right. Yeah, they they paid, paid for, for the mailbox. For Hold on. They probably mine, paid mine, two mine or three put times. Mine crappy windows. <laughs> right. Yeah. So yeah. when well, is somebody going to put pony up and pay for that? Terrible. Well, the you snow. Know? If the snow breaks them, I would want to talk about that. And what we're talking the rain about. Does. <laughs> for whatever reason, the volume of snow that was thrown during this last cycle broke a lot of mail posts and a lot of mailboxes. And I'm not going to get into why there was so much volume of snow, but people have to put their mailbox within six inches of the curb. They have no choice. But you also look at mailboxes that are, uh, or the wood posts or plastic posts are 10 years old. The I mean, you can't well, figure they're going to last forever. The, the defect is not, doesn't appear to be the amount of snow. I don't know, how do you know relatively um, out of the 150 was Foxmore? Or Foxmore and Fairfield. That's our total list, but the majority was okay. from That's those what I was two wondering. subdivisions. That's so village wide. I mean, yeah. um, the older parts of town don't have that. But my th my thing is, my thinking is that it's the defective product more than the amount of snow. And so I think we need to do a really good job here of ensuring that every one of those that gets replaced gets in a really good mailbox. Yeah. Uh, and I think everybody's agreed on that and the $75 <clears throat> if we hit it. But to think, to, to, to single out just these two and say, because you were under the assumption that the annexation agreement required a certain thing, which I don't know that we dictated, we didn't in the meanwhile say, oh, your mailbox broke, you have your annexation agreement, make sure you put it in a PVC uh, thing. It was, I don't think we dictate that, but maybe we did. But if we've misled somebody, that's one thing. But if, if they went on an assumption and put in a, you know, the cheapest mailbox they can find, because some people aren't going to put in one that lasts 15, 20, 30 years, they're going to find the one at Menards that meets the white requirement. It just feels like we would single out two subdivisions, and then if somebody comes in from Orchard Prairie North that said, well, I was under the assumption I had to follow theirs, or whatever it was, or mine's plastic and the snow hit mine, like, do we have to do that then village-wide, and would we say yes to that? Um, we have a good opportunity now because we have 150 of them down. They need to be put in. So I think we need to be clear on our guidance. We could come up with a standard and say well, this is what you're doing. Well, they, I mean, we talked about the standard, but we need to ensure that they, Foxmore and Fairfield, know mm -hmm. we don't care the material. The annexation agreement says this. You would be in compliant, compliance with that if you do this. And also be sure that you install that six inches behind the curb per code. <coughs> so with that, I think anybody that, um, I would encourage anybody that's replacing their mailbox currently or that you know might be considered for this, replace it with the best mailbox that you want to pay for. And we might, be re we might revise the ordinance at the next meeting. We'll talk about the snow, if the snow hits it, because I, I even, <coughs> does that work? And can we put on the agenda an actual, I don't know, policy or whatnot that says $75 if the plow hits it, or if we hit it, I guess, whatever, you'll figure it out. Yep. Cool? And we'll talk about it then. And I don't want to, I'm not cutting anybody off. No, I'm having <laughs> breakfast, so don't worry about it. Okay. <laughs> be back here in like 10, 10 hours. Yeah. Okay, so let's move on to, uh, if that's okay, we'll move on to, to item F, which is microgrid energy. Who wants this one? All right. Smile. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> Who gets it? The gentleman that uh, wanted to present this tonight couldn't make the meeting, so he apologizes for that. But um, we've been requested to take a look at um, microgrid energy would like to put a solar field at the southeast corner of Albright and Awcut. There's a 10 acre site now there that's um, some of some of you might recall in years past was kind of a, a dump area, uh, an unauthorized dump area, I should say. Anyway, there's some challenges on the site to look at really um, a significant development. This would not be a significant development. Obviously, they could work around uh, some of the landfill uh, situations, and part of it is in the floodplain, part of it is in a floodway. They'd have to stay out of the floodway completely. Mm -hmm. They would maybe have to compensate for post, for, say, uh, the solar panels um, going in the floodplain that uh, they could mitigate 
offsite at one and a half to one uh, ratio. Anyway, as a part of this uh, overall program, and this ties in with the state's program on um, alternative energy, um, the developer of the property would like to request that the village um, help fund the development of this site with a uh, uh, 58, uh, $58,000 from TIF funds. This site is in TIF number two on Alcott Road at uh, Albright. So that's the request uh, in terms of um, the developer looking for the village assistance in terms of a TIF fund. I have a question. Did you have more to say? <laughs> there's a, I, I just wanted to say that there's a lot of information in your packet about the energy system itself and the company that wants to do this. They're, they're doing it in other states. They're, they're looking at concentrating on some uh, Illinois communities because of uh, state legislation that would allow these programs. Um, it would also, I might also add that it could potentially help cut um, utility bills. Um, they gave the example of, I believe that uh, residents now pay um, six cents per kilowatt hour, if I'm not mistaken. They estimated that the uh, residents could see a savings of one cent per kilowatt hour. So in other words, going down to five. How, is, how would that be possible? If they um, participate, if the residents. Um, Did you not read the stuff? It tells you in there. Read the whole thing. It tells you in there how that works. Telling me no. Okay, back to my question. Yes. <laughs> so the fifty-eight thousand that they're looking for from the TIF, uh, I see they're also looking. They're they're requesting that all fees through the village that are associated with this project be waived. Is that included in the fifty-eight thousand that they're asking from the TIF fund? No. I mean, yeah, it's in addition to the the waiver of the fees would be in addition. In addition to the, to the fifty-eight thousand. Correct. And, Roughly for this type of project, what what are we looking at for fees from the villa for the village? Be minimal. I, I don't minimal. have it. I can get a dollar amount. I don't. I think it would be minimal. A few okay. hundred dollars probably. Um, I, I would just like to talking like legal engineering. Yes, there it would be more substantial for legal and engineering review in terms of building permit fees. It would be minimal. We okay. can give you an estimate next time on the cost of. Uh, legal and engineering. Okay. Do we estimate that this will generate any TIF revenue? It will only generate minimal TIF revenue because it's only going to significant, it's not going to significantly add to the EAV because of the yeah. type of development. So you're not going to offset, or at least we don't believe that you would offset the, the TIF funds being uh, used on this project with the increase in EAV. Mm -hmm. There's also uh, supposedly state legislation that's may be coming forward that would limit, um, and it hasn't been passed yet, but um, limit the amount of property tax that could be charged to, um, I forget if it's 2,000 or 5,000 a year. 5,000 5, a year. So. For, for a solar project? For a solar okay. uh, panel project. All right. I'd like to see if they've done, the, they haven't done this in Illinois, this is the first one, or other states they said they had? They've done it in other states. They've done, I believe it's Missouri and right. uh, Colorado. They're working on developing other projects up and running in Illinois, but I don't know that they have any as of right now. So the, the state last year passed in that nuclear bailout, well, we're all paying, funding into this solar program uh, up to a quarter on your ComEd bill. And so I'm assuming there's some, some, hopefully some state funds available to this project. I get a little leery when we're paying for um, uh, some of their due diligence costs. It just seems odd to me, like a phase one ESA. And while I'm supportive of this type of project. Yeah, they may ask us to knock all those trees down. <laughs> well, they'd have to take all the trees yeah, down. Yeah, they would, but they may want us no, but to that's, pay the bill or something. But that's, that's included in here, grubbing of trees and brush. 40,000, so they're essentially. Well, and, and if you look at qualifying yeah. TIF fees, it, it does talk about qualified TIF fees would be for site preparation. This yeah. would be site preparation. preparation. Yeah. All I know is I remember solar at Fifth Avenue in Waterford, they have a stoplight. They put a big windmill up with solar on top of that. 
And in the end, that did not even pay to do the stoplight. They had to bring in electricity in. So some of the solar stuff, maybe in these bigger programs might work, but some of them don't. And I presume these guys would want to take it to the industrial center down there and sell them the electric rather than residential, which ain't even close to anybody from there. Would input from Commonwealth Edison on that subject be useful as to how receptive they are to having electricity fed into their system and how it would be compensated? Well, they're allowed to tie into the grid, so it, it's it's allowable whether ComEd likes it or not. It's it's, it's allowable. They're required to allow it. Yeah. Yes. They get to set the price for it, I believe, though. I don't think they're required to pay any particular price. Um, yeah, I, don't I think know they how it works. pay the going rate. Something like the that. Credit. Yeah, my neighbor's got him on his roof, and he gets credited back when he overproduces. I think that's all. They, they're they're required required to buy set back that, when he set those rates. So. I don't see a, like a direct impact to the TIF for something like this, but. I would be comfortable waiving our fees for some for, to promote a solar project. Because it's not really going to generate, you know, it's not going to generate any money being in the TIF. So isn't that what the idea of the TIF is to encourage development, not stagnance? Well, this is, yeah, I mean, this is a redevelopment of a, of a substandard site or the first develop, the Greenfield development of it or whatever, but. Any other thoughts? Is this time sensitive, probably? Well, they'd like to get going as soon as possible. He was uh, hoping to get a final answer by the board at the next meeting mm -hmm. um, in terms of a yay or nay on the, on the TIF contribution. Well, what are, what are some of your thoughts? Where are you leaning? I don't see them making any money for us at all. Uh, I can see them using property that will never be used for anything else. West Aurora wanted to put their bus department there, and they can't because the land sinks. This is pipes in there, and it doesn't, it's not going to sink, but mm -hmm. it's about the only place, thing you can do with it. But. Yeah, I mean, I'm not opposed to the use. Yeah, there are oh. too many other alternative uses no, for this property isn't. based on its existing condition and the floodplain and the floodway. Um, and, it, you know, you could say it's a brownfield site in a sense. So but, we're not going to see an industrial building on this property, I don't believe, without a lot of work, obviously. No, but and what my biggest concern is this is the first request we've had for TIF funds from a proposed development. And we should hopefully expect a lot of these in the coming years, and we just need to be responsible at how we look at you know utilizing those funds, especially after all the conversations we've had about about those funds. Mm -hmm. I think it's a, a creative project for <coughs> the site. Again, I don't know that we could really have much of anything else there. However. It's a wooded site, so it is doing something for the environment. What about some new trees for our parkways? You know, when you cut trees down, right. you replace trees so that they you know, replant somewhere else. I know forestry does that a lot. Want to do that for fifty-eight thousand dollars? <laughs> I mean, that's that's what you're asking, right? Do we want to do the fifty-eight thousand dollars from the tip? Right? Yeah, or some amount. I mean, we don't have to fund the whole part, but is it is it worth, in your opinion, the use of some TIF funds? I think if you give them 58000 the next one that comes is going to say, well, you gave those guys something that you're never going to get any money back on. you got to give me this because you're going to get something back. And mm -hmm. if you were that... If I could suggest maybe 60. you look at the laundry list of what they've asked to be used mm -hmm. out of TIF funds and... It's kind of a menu. You pick and choose which of the things that you think beyond just the permit fees and possibly our right. consultant fees. So the, that's a good point because if you look at some of this stuff, even if they don't move forward with the project, something like a phase one ESA is an important thing to have done on a site if it were to redevelop into something else. Um, 
you know, some of those other things like the grubbing. Maybe not, but. I think we get less uh, decisive at 11.30 at night. Yes. Would this application be suitable for the Avaya property where some of the land can't be disturbed, but this would sit on top of it? Um, well, not to penetrate this, the surface uh, because we have some sites on the Avaya property where you cannot you couldn't Would, sink the post to do the the um, soil pan or soil the solar panels. So we would disturb the. In some of the locations on the buy site, as we understand it. I think my concern is I don't see this adding taxable value to the TIF land. I'm listening carefully to your comment that it would be very expensive to develop the land. Yes. To me, that I guess I'd like to see some thoughts about very expensive. That's supposed to be the purpose of the TIF, really, is to take undevelopable land and make it usable. An eligible TIF fund definitely is site preparation. That's clearly in the standards. Okay, but the the intended eventual use is not going to likely add to the tax value. Not significantly, no. All right, so we'll add this. Can we? We'll bring this up again in a couple of weeks at the next meeting um, to discuss further. Because I'm supportive of. I think we need to be supportive of projects like this, mm -hmm. uh, but you know maybe not to the tune of uh, fifty-eight thousand dollars. But is there some uh, value to where it is worth it? You know whatever we might estimate their increase, whether it's par partial or waiving some of our fees, uh, just working with them a little bit. But again, this is their first ask. I mean, they've, it's like, I expect to receive a lot of these requests over the next 20 some years. So, thank All you. Right. Whoa, almost. Ooh. Okay, so please don't have any new or unfinished business. Okay. Uh, future meetings, you see them, executive session? We're still doing that? Okay. I'll entertain a motion to go into executive session for three purposes listed. And um, so moved. Second. Second. Trustee Youngerman. Yeah. Trustee Marisak. All right. Yes. Trustee Vaughn. Yes. Trustee Sperling. Yes. And Trustee Lee. All right. And the only action item afterwards will be a report on closed session minutes. So if you're. If you, Need to go? You got, oh, I gotta wait. Do I moved? No, Second. I can't. Because can. we got a vote. Yeah, oh. Yep. Yeah. That's me. You can second. I'll second. Whatever. All right. Lawyer, you gonna say that? Yes. I was first, but Steve wants wait. to do it. Second. We have to wait for them to see because we got a vote. She heard. All right, so I'll call the meeting back to order. Turn it over to our attorney. Okay, so after executive session, the recommendation is to release the uh, meeting minutes of September 11th, 2017. Second. 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 Call the roll. Trustee Sperling. Yes. Trustee Lee. Yes. Trustee Youngerman. Yay. Trustee Marisak. Yes. Trustee Bond. Yes. And that carries. Uh, entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. moved. Second. Second. Call the roll. <laughs> Trustee Youngerman? Yay. Trustee Marisak? Yes. Trustee Bond? Yes. Trustee Sperling? Yes. Trustee Lee? Yes. Good night. Thank you. My breakfast right here. Turn the microphones off, though. No, you can't.